Um, so next up on the agenda, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Miss Carrie Stokes. So Carrie is fresh off the plane from Washington, D.C., is that right, Carrie? Um, just a few hours back. So um, as a brief introduction, Carrie uh, has worked for over 25 years in international development and the environment. Hard to believe that number, Carrie, but I'll... I'll yeah. <laughs> Um, so she, Carrie currently serves as the first geographer of the U.S. Agency for International Development, headquartered in Washington, D.C. She established and now directs the agency's Geo Center, which applies geographic analysis to USAID's international development programming. Prior to becoming the agency geographer, Carrie served as the director of the Servier program for USAID in a joint venture with NASA. Carrie has a technical background in GIS, global climate change, and natural resource management. So I'm very happy to welcome to the podium Ms. Carrie Stokes. Thank you. This is um, a pretty exciting time for me because this is my first hot summit to attend. So I am um, looking forward to the rest of the afternoon, since I unfortunately missed this morning. Um, but the energy that I have felt in the few hours I have just been here has been incredible. And uh, I, I can't wait to see what the rest of the afternoon will hold. So as you just learned, I work for USAID, the US Agency for International Development, which is the lead foreign assistance agency for the US government. We work in nearly 100 countries around the world. Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, Eastern Europe. And our objective is to end extreme poverty. This is a laudable goal. And for me, it's very personal. Many years ago, I didn't know the number 25 was going to come out publicly, but Many years ago, I lived and worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in one of the poorest countries in the world. For those of you who are not familiar with the Peace Corps, it's a program that the US government supports. Many of the volunteers who join are right out of university, but you don't have to be right out of university. Um, they commit for two years, and they go to a country that they're sent to to provide technical assistance, to learn about the culture and the people, and to live with them, and to then bring back what they learned to the United States to help Americans better understand about how others in the world live. So in my case, I had a mud hut in the middle of a millet field. It was in the country of Niger, which is in West Africa. Like that community that welcomed me, I had no electricity, I had no indoor plumbing, and every day I walked to the well to fetch my water. And I even learned how to carry it back to my house on my head. It turns out carrying heavy things on your head is pretty practical. You should try it sometime. This time was well before the days of email, internet, and cell phones. So learning to live in these extreme conditions that the community I was with, it was normal for them, but for me it was quite challenging. I had to get used to different food and being around people who were, had food, in, food insecure. I wasn't used to that in my country in the US. I had to get used to the heat of the desert, sometimes over 120 degrees, that's Fahrenheit, not Celsius. <laughs> it's hot in Celsius as well. I had to get used to no air conditioning in that heat. I had to get used to the difference in gender roles in the country that I was living in very conservative country. Women and men had very distinct roles in the community. 
and I was a woman in this conservative country. I wasn't used to not having a voice automatically when I had, when I had opportunities to gather as a group. I had to get used to a different religion than the one I was brought up with. I had to learn an entirely new language. The language is not a written language. So the way I had been taught to, write, to learn a language, the formal way in school, was not going to work this time. I had to learn to listen and spend time with people and understand the context of the words from the way they were expressing them in their daily lives. I had to get used to animals living alongside people outdoors. Yes, I grew up with pets. We had cats and a bunny rabbit and fish. But I, nothing prepared me for waking up in the middle of the night with a cow chewing above my head. So there were all kinds of adventures that I got exposed to in this new and different world. The lack of education was one that was particularly shocking for me as well. Not just for girls, but also for boys and for adults. I had never been in a community before that did not have the kinds of education opportunities that I had grown up with. I had actually grown up in a, in a town where most people were rocket scientists, so I came from a highly educated small town in the state of Alabama. So, I think of all of these differences and these challenges, the ones that probably hit me the most were living with people and working alongside them and realizing that they have difficulties as a poor community with dependencies on many factors that they could not control. This was a completely different philosophy of living than my Western culture had taught me. Yet, after three years, I stayed an extra year. I couldn't bring myself to leave after the two. After three years of living with this semi-nomadic community, as different as it had all seemed at first, I discovered, along with my new friends in the village, that we actually had a very similar vision of the kind of world we wanted to live in. The dreams that they had for their children were very similar to the dreams that I know my parents had for me and that I hoped to have to pass on to the next generation later in my life. By the time my three-year volunteer experience had ended, the resilient people of the country of Niger had stolen my heart. And I had a passion to stay connected to those who had less than I had. In today's world of technology, you don't have to live for three years in a mud hut to contribute to a community in the developing world. In fact, if we're going to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we must take advantage of the data revolution in which we are all living. And we're going to have to find innovative ways to address age-old challenges of poverty. At USAID, we're working together with partners to employ smart strategies that leverage the biggest hearts and the brightest minds from all over the world to seek sustainable and inclusive solutions. So that's where you all come into this picture. With the team that I have the privilege to lead at USAID, known as the GeoCenter, we like to think of ourselves as data revolutionaries. We are a fairly new startup group of geographers and data analysts. We're embedded within the walls of USAID, and we are working to push the boundaries of the most influential donor agency in the world. This is a new experiment for us as an agency. Never before the team that is called the GeoCenter had, had there been an internal capacity to apply data and analytics to inform the kinds of decision making that USAID does on a regular basis. So how are we doing this work? We are incorporating maps. We are incorporating geographic analysis. And the latest in technology and tools, 
to inform decision making about exactly where USA should be working to address poverty. We are all passionate in our belief that we can make a difference in the way our agency does business and therefore impact the people and programs in countries like Niger. Last year, in support of the OSM community, the GeoCenter launched a new, pro a, a new program in partnership with three founding universities, Texas Tech University, George Washington University, and West Virginia University. These universities, are two of those three are represented here today. I would like for Patricia Solis, please to raise your hand, as well as Nula and Richard from GW. Could you raise your hand if they room? Okay, so this is great. We have two of our three founding universities here, and they will be talking uh, later this afternoon in their session about uh, the program that we launched last year called the Youth Mappers Initiative. When we launched this, we had three universities, and this was less than, less than a year ago. We now have 30 universities from 12 countries around the world that have voluntarily signed up to join the Youth Mappers program. And the numbers keep growing. Every time I talk with Patricia, she tells me about yet one more university chapter that has signed up to join the program. It's exciting. The importance of HOT and OSM to this program cannot be understated. Your experience in the HOT community for the last six years is important to us in the Geo Center. As I said, we're new. We're still learning. We're trying to make an impact on our agency. Well, we're just about to be five years old in November. So you will have one year on us. And we are definitely looking to learn from you, to draw from your incredible talent, your expertise, your passion, and your dedication, and the work that you've been doing since this group got its start. As a key partner in the Youth Mappers program, we are working to empower university students to create new geospatial data where it is needed for humanitarian and for longer term development projects around the world. Given the popularity of Youth Mappers so far and the increasing worldwide demand on the hot tasking manager in general, I am really pleased to announce that we in the Geo Center at USAID are committing to provide direct support to help revamp the tasking manager. So this is quite exciting for us because we rely on it, you rely on it, many more people in the world are relying on this than I think were originally envisioned when it was built. So once the, once the improvements and the upgrades are in place, probably within the next year, we expect that it will be more stable to handle the larger volume of mappers around the world, that it will allow for monitoring statistics of mapped features, and be easier to use in general. So I invite you to talk to Tyler about the specific details of what is to come with this. But we are quite excited about the enhanced functionality of the future of the tasking manager. Recent work with the partners and students in, um, is already showing incredible promise with this Youth Mappers program of the Geo Center. You've heard about some of this already today, and you'll be hearing more about some of these examples. You already have many of your own incredible examples. I just want to name a few. In Colombia, in support of that country's historic peace process that is currently underway, we are working with five university youth mapper chapters and the local OSM community. So, Umberto, where are you? Can you raise your hand? Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, over here. So, Verita's got incredible energy and is leading an OSM community in his country, and we are privileged to be able to work with him to create new data in areas that have been neglected for many years during the conflict in that country. With new detailed roads and a database that the local government can use to better plan for services to underserved people in the northern part of the country, 
we feel that this has got great promise to show the value of data for decision making and putting it in the very hands of the people who can benefit from it the most. From Latin America to Southeast Asia, we are partnering with the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, as well as the SEVERE program, NASA, and other parts of USAID to map inundated areas in the river basins that are spanning Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, and China. With the increase in construction of dams in this region, there is a huge need to understand the impacts on river ecology and assess the disaster risk to local communities. So the mapping work that, we'll, that we are doing now involving students and these partners will help provide for the decisions that need to get made as the current dams are being managed and as new ones may be coming online. In Mozambique, just a little while ago, you may have heard Chad Blevins, currently here from the Geo Center. He's leading our Mapping for Resilience work, and he gave a full presentation on the kinds of data that we're creating with our partners in the Peace Corps, as well as students from the Youth Mappers program, to inform malaria prevention programs in that country. Malaria is one of the highest killers of children under five in Africa, and Mozambique is a country in particular that suffers from malaria. So we're already seeing that this information is going to be used by the people who conduct the spray campaigns in the field to target the homes where people live and sleep. The idea here is to ensure we're killing the mosquitoes that carry the malaria, and we don't know where to go without the, the mapped data to understand which homes are the ones to target and which ones have yet to be sprayed. So this information will be used this year in the next spray campaign. In each of these examples, data is being created by people in one part of the world to help people in another part of the world. HOT and OSM technology is enabling people to form virtual partnerships in support of something bigger than themselves. From the poorest people who owned few possessions, I learned that one of the most powerful things you can give to another person is your time and your attention. Thank you for giving your time and your attention to all the people you may never actually meet in the places you may never actually go to. What you are doing is truly revolutionary. I was reminded a few weeks ago about just how amazing the work of this community is when our first ever intern in the Geo Center came uh, to a close and was presenting to the agency what she had learned over the summer working with us. I was moved. She said in school she had studied development and she had learned that to make a difference and an impact takes a really long time. Now I can attest to that myself as it's now in public that I have been working at this endeavor for a very long time. <laughs> but what she said she learned over the summer was that in just a few short minutes, she could volunteer her time and make a difference in somebody else's life on the other side of the world. And for that, she was proud. And for that, I was proud. And for that, I want to tell you how proud I am to even be associated with this community. As I get to know your work better, as I look for ways that I can support you and us going forward, because as we all know, none of us does this alone. This is a community that I think volunteers passionately holds a vision about what's possible, and regardless of the challenges that we may face, whether it's people don't understand what we're trying to say and what we're trying to do, they don't understand the technology, there aren't enough resources, there aren't enough time, you know, enough time in the day, whatever those challenges are, this community is not letting it stop them. And I love being part of this energy. It makes me feel young again. 
And if we, if we continue to invest as you have to date, I am confident that the next generation of interns will be 25 years from today standing at a podium like this talking about how the whole world has been mapped and all of the places where that information is needed. And now we're trying to add 3D elevation data to show the buildings in a city, whatever that future may look like. I can't even imagine it, but I thank you for your incredible dedication and for welcoming me into your community. I look forward to what we can do together in the future. Thanks.